Hi folks and welcome back. In this video, I want to take a look at the final paper we read for this week, How Do Patients Know by Quill Kukla. Now, we left off uh, at the end of the paper on the form models with the idea that the deliberative model is the ideal model of the doctor-patient relationship because it is the model that builds in a sense of autonomy that has this long history in the Western tradition. It's a quite robust sense of autonomy that ensures that the, the choices that a patient makes are reflective of that patient's true values. That is, they are choices that uh, uh, accord with values that withstand the test of reason or that withstand critical reflection uh, by the patient themselves in consultation with their doctor and perhaps with others. Uh, and the inputs to the decision then are the patient's values and doctor's values together, along with the information or the knowledge that the doctor brings to bear on these circumstances. That is the diagnostic information, the medical research, and the background knowledge that the doctor has. Now, along with the other three models, the paternal or the Deliberative model makes a, a really big assumption. It makes the assumption that the doctor has all the facts. That is, that they're the ones with the expertise and access to information. And it's that assumption that Kukla pushes on in her paper. Um, is this assumption really warranted? Well, think about it. What's the first thing you do when you experience symptoms or you get a diagnosis? If you're like me, you get your phone out and you start Googling, uh, or you sit down at your computer and you start Googling. Uh, you want to find out for yourself what's going on. You put your symptoms in uh, to, to Dr. Google and try to find out what's going on. You look up your diagnosis on WebMD or on the Mayo Clinic uh, and try to get a better understanding of it. Um, so you turn to these other sources of information. We are what Kukla calls active inquirers. That is, we do not passively consume information that is provided by an expert. We actively go out and seek information that will be useful to us. And the norms and expectations for patients have changed pretty dramatically over the last few decades. It used to be the case that this information was is in fact the purview of medical professionals. They were the ones who went to med school. They're the ones who have access to the medical journals. They're the ones who can keep up on cutting edge research. But that's not so much the case anymore. The internet and cable news have changed this dramatically. We all have access to this sort of information. And in fact, we're all expected to uh, self-inform about our own medical conditions. Practices of self-informing are represented as part of responsible health care management. They're a thing that we think we ought to do. And in fact, we see it, and patients tend to see it, as a form of empowerment. Having this knowledge, having access to this knowledge, means that we are not simply at the whims of physicians. We're not simply being treated with, uh, with medications or with procedures that we don't fully understand. Uh, we can actually make fully informed decisions about our own care, or at least that's the ideal. We may fail in many cases to live up to that ideal because we may fail in many cases to actually do a good job of sorting through the information that's available to us. But in any case, this norm clearly exists. We clearly expect others to, uh, to seek out information when they receive a diagnosis, and we clearly do that ourselves. Um, in fact, a survey of doctors, uh, a family physician shows that uh, according to their estimates, 60% said patients are coming into the office more frequently because they read about their symptoms online. 97% believe that patients are coming into the office with misinformation. 79% believe that patients are more likely to question their physician's diagnoses or recommendations on the basis of information they seek out on their own. This may be good. This may be bad. Um, it means you know, physicians are certainly fallible. They make mistakes, and it's good to question them. 
but they also have a great deal more expertise than the average patient. And so we ought to uh, accept their authority in some cases. And this is a negotiation that we need to think very carefully about. How do we weigh the physician's expertise and authority against the possible mistakes that uh, they may make? Um, and physicians also think that 83% of their patients regularly confirm their treatments or diagnoses using an online medical resource. So we always follow up on what the physicians tell us. Um, where do we get this information? Where do we turn when we're looking for all of this information? Well, we get it from all over the place. We get it on the web. That's for sure. We go to WebMD, we go to Mayo Clinic, we just Google our symptoms and, and f try to figure out what's going on. Uh, we get it from friends and family. We talk to people uh, and uh, learn from their experiences. We may get it from books if anybody still reads those. Uh, we certainly get it from TV, right? I'm sure you've learned some medical information from Grey's Anatomy or House uh, uh, or some other, you know, Chicago Med, some other show. Uh, we get it from apps that track our nutrition, track our activities, uh, give us suggestions about healthier eating. We get it from message boards where we go out and share information with one another on the web, uh, where we form communities around common diagnoses or common symptoms trying to learn from one another about them. We get them from Facebook. We might just ask people for input on Facebook. Hey, I was diagnosed with such and such. Does anyone have an experience with this? Right, we get this information from all over the place. So the question we face is, is, is it any good, right? I mean, I'm sure we've all had the experience where we Googled our symptoms and we found out we were dying. Um, you know, I, the, the, so there's a lot of information out there that's just not very good. Uh, is it, is any of it worth anything to us? Well, to get at that question, we need to think about how this information is structured and how it might be useful to us. The first thing to note is that it's not hierarchically structured in the way that information used by physicians is. Right? The information that doctors have access to, the information that filters down through the medical establishment, has this sort of hierarchical structure. And by that, what I mean and what Kukla means is that um, there, there are set procedures by which we develop uh, and test hypotheses uh, and uh, and by which these these bits of information garner the support of physicians. So uh, someone might have an idea, they test out that idea, uh, they develop a hypothesis, they test out that hypothesis, they write a paper on it, that paper goes through peer review uh, and it's published and then others try to replicate their, uh, their findings or push back on the theoretical framework that they're using. Uh, challenge those ideas and this all help happens under the public eye or at least under the eye of, of practicing physicians and researchers uh, and so this this information that finally filters down to your physician has passed these tests uh, we can be sure that it is it is um, uh, it is it is viable information because it has uh, has gone through this gauntlet of peer review and uh, and pushback from the the peer community. Um, but the information that we have access to online isn't like that. Anybody can publish a blog, and even the people who have even the the, the websites that have some credibility uh, are you know, we don't we don't know who's running them. We don't know who can change things or edit things on them. We don't always ha know who their sources are. Um, so this information that's available to us, Kukla says isn't hierarchically structured. Rather, it forms an organic, multi-layered array through which we must negotiate a path. It's complicated, unregulated, and fraught with potential for deception and conflicts of interest. So we're facing this morass of information that's coming at us or that's available to us. Uh, and it's, it's just this organic hole, this mess uh, of information that we need to sort through. And it takes particular kinds of skills to sort through that. We can't just trust what we find in front of us. Rather, we need to develop a sort of toolkit for sorting through that information. And we need access to others to sort through that information. We can't often do it on our own. So we need skills and we need assistance in order to make sense of this organic morass of information. 
um, we need to be able to access experts. We need to be able to uh, get expert opinions about different ideas from from experts that we trust. Uh, we also need uh, to develop and be taught skills for uh, judging the credibility of experts, judging the credibility of information that we found online, uh, for uh, figuring out you know, what's what's fake news and what's not, for figuring out what's a viable source and inf of information and what's not, and for figuring out how to apply that information to our own case. Um, one of the big pieces of information that we lack in the medical context is a really good understanding of biology, chemistry, and human anatomy. I think most of us were taught these subjects, or taught health in school, uh, in high school, by our gym teachers who, God loves gym teachers, right? They're, they're wonderful people. Some of my friends are gym teachers, um, but most of them didn't go into that profession because they wanted to teach health class. Most of them went into that profession because they were athletes and they wanted to be close to the close to athletics um, and health class is just something else they have to do maybe driver's ed too right um, and uh, and so we didn't all get the best education when it comes to uh, when it comes to the human body and it comes to our health um, and so we often lack the information we need in order to apply even uh, even credible information that we access online to our own case. So what does this mean for autonomy? How should we understand an account of autonomy given these particular needs in this, this epistemic realm or in this knowledge practice uh, that we're talking about? Well, it means that we need a relational account of autonomy. We need to understand autonomy as skilled and competent coping in the course of our investigational practices, our attempts to discern, know, predict, and make appropriate guesses and decisions. So we need to understand autonomy not as others staying out of our way, once again, uh, not as uh, a kind of... Um, uh, a kind of epistemic uh, egoism, right? Not that we, we have to allow, we have to keep others out of our way so that we can figure out what's going on. Rather, we need a relational account of autonomy. We need to understand how we rely on others in order to figure out what's going on, how we rely on them to help test claims that we, we come across, and how we rely on them to develop skills that will help us better sort through this information. That's what we mean by a relational account of autonomy. So how do we support relational autonomy? Well, the capacity for autonomous inquiry, we must understand, inheres not in individuals, but rather it depends on our social, institutional, and material position. We're what Kukla calls situated knowers. We are not... Um, atomic knowers. We are not simply detached from the rest of our community in epistemic terms. We are situated in a particular place within a particular community and will make better decisions when those around us are knowledgeable, trustworthy, and helpful, when we have good access to reliable information, and when we have the support we need to help us exercise good judgment. So these are the things we need in order to support this notion of, uh, of epistemic relational autonomy. And epistemic just means having to do with knowledge. And we're going to talk more about that next week, but it's an important term, having to do with knowledge. Epistemic uh, autonomy needs to be supported by trustworthy, knowledgeable people that we can interact with, get information from, test claims with, uh, discuss information with, and we have to have access to reliable information. So we need access to these various sources of information, and we need to be supported in the exercise of good judgment. That means we need to have a good education. We need to have been taught these tools or these skills for sorting through all of this information that is available to us. We need help with this navigation through this morass of information that we have at our fingertips. And doctors can play an important role here. 
doctors can help us sort through this information that's available to us. They can help us by recognizing that patients are situated knowers and active inquirers and recognize that their patients are doing research and are bringing that research into the clinic with them, into the, into the, uh, into the exam room with them. Uh, and doctors, rather than simply ignoring that fact, need to engage with patients about the information that they're gathering for themselves. They need to ask them what they know. What research have you done before you even came to me? What websites are you using? What sources do you normally turn to? Can you print out those studies that you've been reading so that we can go over them together next time you come in uh, and see whether this trial is really something that would be that would be good for you? Can you you uh, can you share those websites with me so that I can look over them and do a bit of research on my own so that I can see whether I think this is something that we should be pursuing or something that would be in your best interest rather than merely saying okay I know you've done some research but uh, here's what I think you need to do or simply ignoring the fact that patients do research which is what most doctors do and simply saying here's my here's my recommendation because when doctors do that their recommendation becomes just one among many things that the patient is hearing they used doctors are no longer quite as authoritative as they used to be in this realm. Um, and they need to be able to reclaim that authority. But to be able to reclaim their epistemic authority, their authority as knowers in this realm, they need not to, uh, to steamroll their patients, but rather to regain the trust of their patients by showing them that they are doing the epistemic work with them. They're doing the knowledge gathering with them. So we get a new model uh, once we've been through this, uh, through this reflection on the way that patients know. A new model in which autonomy is relational on both the epistemic and the evaluative dimensions. That means that uh, patients' values get tested against the doctor's values, and the patient and the doctor are both gathering information. The doctor is gathering evidence from diagnostic tests, medical research, their own background knowledge, uh, and patients are uh, gathering information uh, from their own background knowledge, uh, their own uh, online research, and from the testimony of others, from all those sorts of sources we've talked about. And they need to collaboratively analyze that information and feed that into the medical decision. So that's how patients know, according to Kukla's account. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.